Hi, we're here with Lori Allman, a Minnesota-based artist and naturalist who um, has for years been doing work that is not only grabbing statewide attention but national and global attention and Lori will be telling us more about her work. And one of the reasons why I was asking Lori to come talk to us in addition to her amazing artwork is that you've noticed in the book that there isn't much about art, popular culture, entertainment, culture in general, as a form of environmental communication. So um, I was wanting to have Lori come and talk to us about her, and you've just seen Anticipating Rhythm, um, her, her work. And so let's maybe start there before we get more general. Um, I know that a piece of art like that is very polysemic, evokes a lot of different ideas and possible interpretations. 
And not all artists like to say, here's what my intention was as artist to do that. But could you share some of your thoughts on what you were wanting to express or communicate when you started this work and with this piece? Sure. Uh, I have to say that I, my first uh, primary reason for doing this was I've been a writer and, and usually tell stories with words. And as an artist in residence at the Bell Museum, uh, I had the opportunity to experiment and to do more creative work and, and play uh, in media that I had not before. So for me, it was partly a love story uh, for nature without words. And that, that was part of the impetus. I, I had also learned the limitations of words, having been involved in some uh, environmental issues in my local area and uh, in the state. And um, I had seen the limitations of words. And I, I understand that in all issues, including environmental issues, there are different levels at which people approach them. And for me, anticipating rhythm was a way to get at some of those deeper levels. And for me, um, sound, audio, has always been a real route to a deeper place. And when you get to, uh, into uh, nature, the visuals, of course, the, are so powerful. Uh, the, the structures, the individual species, the movement, uh, whether it's plants or animals. And your piece captures patterns so well. Right? That's right. My, my, my interest in nature has always been more toward patterns and structures and relationships. Mm -hmm. and as opposed to knowing every, the identity of every bird or plant, for example. Mm -hmm. So anticipating rhythm is uh, also a celebration of those aspects of nature at all different scales. Mm -hmm. Great, wonderful. Um, you reminded me of the, the old saying that writing about music is like dancing about architecture. Right. <laughs> you know, that, that frustration with the limits of words, that's wonderful. In fact, that's something we'll, we'll get to in a second with this, what the students are doing as far as their assignment. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how you made it, the actual process? Because I think watching that one's fascinated by thinking, where is that image from and how did you make that? Sure. Uh, I was delighted to be able to use the photographs that were taken uh, as part of a program called In a New Light. And it is um, a, a program designed for young people who are experiencing periods of difficulty. It, it's, um, it's for kids helping them, it, a program that helps kids through rough emotional times in their lives. It's called Northwest Passage. And these are all kids who had the chance to have a camera put in their hand and go out into nature and use that process of immersion in nature and focus on the beauty of nature as a way to transform themselves. And you can see that in their images. So these are teenagers and uh, young adults who are um, finding their own um, way through their own issues through nature. Mm -hmm. And I think that that power comes across in those images. And I've, I was aware of that program and very moved by the images that, the, that these kids are taking, which are terrific, by the way, uh, mm -hmm. technically terrific. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess that was the first part of my process, was having that chance to integrate. I knew I wanted those images mm -hmm. from those kids. And even if the viewer didn't know, that backstory, I think it comes through somehow in the images themselves. They're, they're powerful. Um, the other part of it was uh, playing with sound. Um, I've taken classes in the technology of sound, the science of sound. I've done radio work. Mm -hmm. So to be able to play with um, everything from, well, it's a, you don't always know what you're hearing when you're listening to anticipating rhythm, and I almost should should give the listeners or the watchers um, a, a little play-by-play -play of what it is you're hearing. Oh, yeah. But it's everything from natural sounds that I got from uh, the Macaulay Library at Cornell, mm -hmm. from their audio library. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, uh, it integrates uh, 
sounds from people. There are children's jump rope songs. Mm -hmm. there, are, uh, there are tap dancers uh, from Rhythmic uh, Circus, a local group here. Uh, so it is, it is absolutely playing mm -hmm. uh, with natural sounds, human sounds, and, and art, dance. Mm -hmm. That is great. Thank you. Speaking of art and dance, um, much of, I mentioned that this textbook is policy driven, campaigns driven, um, science communication, risk communication, all of which are extremely important and central. But sometimes people um, marginalize or don't first look at some other ways of mediating environment, the artistic and artful ways, human ways of doing that. So I'd like your, your thoughts on what sort of things, what roles um, does art play in terms of, of communicating ideas about the environment, expressing, and perhaps even in a more denotative sense, educating people about an environment as well. And as part of that, maybe bring in your own background as a naturalist and how you've combined science and art. Sure. I, I see them as part of the same world. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes people think, all right, I'll use art almost mm -hmm. in a manipulative way mm -hmm. to reach a different audience, or yeah. I will use it to try to go deeper into the subject emotionally. Mm -hmm. And I think you can always tell when it's manipulation. Mm -hmm. No one likes mm -hmm. to be manipulated. More propagandistic. That's and, right. Yeah, like a way yeah. of selling something. Yeah. But there is something... Is it okay to do that, for example, though, for a campaign? For example, mentioning Robert Cox, he's very much campaign-oriented, and he has to think about how do you employ these in a campaign structure. Is it okay to do that in that context? Or even there, is it sort of, um, are the two supposed to be completely separated? I think, I think the main thing is that it should be authentic. Hmm. It should be grounded in whatever the issue is itself. Mm -hmm. It's just yeah. a different way of telling the story. Yeah. And when you're in the sciences or the environmental e ecological realm, you're dealing with facts and mm -hmm. you have to be true to those facts first. Yes. Yeah. You have to you can't manipulate the science. So it's the truth value of it. You can't matters. put words in the mouths of the scientists or mm -hmm. overstate something yeah. when the scientists themselves would just say my work suggests this. Yeah. So that's that's part of it is to honor the science. Sure. But but the other is there is an artful way of doing things. Mm -hmm. There's an artful way of talking about science. There's yeah. an artful way to present a story so that people are engaged and they want to listen. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's at the heart of it. I think artists, whether they're poets, whether they're painters, whether they, um, whatever the media is, video, mm -hmm. uh, they are good at telling the story in a way that people want to hear it. Uh, mm -hmm. They won't something, sum something up in a, in a little sound bite. Yeah. They'll let a story unfold. Mm -hmm. They will bring you to a present moment mm -hmm. so that everyone is listening. They will, they will reach out to audiences that otherwise might not get the message. Yeah. And make, because a lot of these things are common to all of us. There aren't mm -hmm. just people who are interested in the environment and people who aren't. Yeah. You know, we all live on the planet, we all grew up here, we all breathe the air. Mm -hmm. um, we have common interests, and I think the arts are a little better at getting people to that point mm -hmm. where everybody's listening, mm -hmm. so that then you can move forward to, to debate the issues. Yeah, okay. So, um, I guess uh, to get at what the students are doing, with these very, it's very much an open project and that was purposeful. So what we chose was the interpretive talk frame, arranger talk, where so many different things could be done from the very abstract and artful to, as I mentioned, campaigns. If somebody did think the exigency is that there's a certain toxin here, people need to know about that and here's how I'm gonna explain that. Um, they could do all of those things regardless of their major or interest in that public land and really try to take the, the place-based approach to that. If you were doing this assignment, having done the work you've done, and the assignment was to do an interpretive talk, and talk can be replaced by about anything there, 
recognizing that what they are doing is actually a, a live recording of that performed talk. So it wouldn't be a, a sort of a, a video where things are put together, like anticipating rhythm. What suggestions would you have for people, either for that, say, that student in the environmental sciences that very much wants to do a sort of uh, science-driven, fact-based narration of a, of a problem, to that student that very much is interested in more artful expression of plays, what are some thoughts you might have for those students doing that kind of work? I would encourage, well, you never, nobody wants to go to the summary of a movie, right? <laughs> right. Right. So you want to, you want to see the story um, in a way where you're not sure what's going to happen next, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So I would focus on, first of all, think of scenes. Um, think of a scene, a small scene, to represent a larger message. Mm -hmm. You can say your larger overarching message in one line, probably. Lead with a thesis. Or right. Yeah. You can, or at the beginning or mm -hmm. the end, or even text on the screen, if they can do that. Mm -hmm. Or a painted sign, whatever <laughs> it is. But save your big overarching messages mm -hmm. for some little punch like that, yeah. but put the body of it into um, telling a very small story that, has, that is powerful. Yeah. Uh, if you're talking about migration, right, mm -hmm. tell the story of a single bird, Yeah. one bird, mm -hmm. and then when you magnify that by 100,000, then you feel the power, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I say that would be one thing, would be tell the small story first mm -hmm. and then sum it up with uh, a, a single line, right? Um, uh, but don't, don't do it predictively, mm -hmm. right? Uh, mm -hmm. Have it unfold in a way where the viewer wants to know what's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. um, I would also say to, to, in order to be interesting, you have to be interested. Yeah. So. I would say the first thing is for them to focus on something that they're genuinely interested in Absolutely. and let the viewer in on their process of learning it. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the most boring things is to learn everything and then be the one who's the expert. The sage on the stage. Yeah. That's right, who's trying to just inform everyone else who's clueless, right? <laughs> so I think if, if they can go at this in such a way where the viewer learns along with them, mm -hmm. is driven by uh, the curiosity that, that they had themselves, mm -hmm. um, then it will have more energy to it, uh, yeah. more authentic energy. That's great advice, wonderful. And, and, and one of the things that I think of when I picture that process where you said find that authentic story, find the true story, find the one that works, is the word work. That, that takes a lot of work, doesn't it? That, that, oh, that yeah. sometimes you stumble on it right away maybe, but there often it's you try this and that's not quite doing it until you find the constellation of things or that pithy story that just really captures it. Is that accurate, would you say, of the artistic process? Ab absolutely. In fact, you might throw away everything that you did that you thought you were mm -hmm. gonna put in it because you'll realize oh, there's one moment in here where it gets interesting. Yeah. And sometimes you can learn that by talking to a friend. I would encourage them, yeah. talk to a friend who knows nothing about your subject, mm -hmm. your, the place you're talking about the issue, and tell them about it. Great. And pay attention to them. Mm -hmm. And s you will naturally start talking in a way that catches their interest. And mm -hmm. you will notice when you've caught it. You'll go to them instead of stay with what you're wanting to do. That's yeah. right. And then, and then think about how you would prepare your video. Yeah. based on whatever that little moment was where there was a flicker of interest, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the, the hard thing is to get rid of all the things that you did that you prepared yeah, that right. took time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but a, a photographer, an mm -hmm. artist, they get, you throw away a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And you, you just keep, you keep the good stuff, right? Yeah, that's great. And that's a great place to end. Thank you so much, Laurie Ullman. Really appreciate it. Sure. All right.